Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm late enough already. <laughs> I apologize and I thank you for waiting. And just it was momentous affairs of state that make me late. As a matter of fact, they start making me late every day at about 9.20. <laughs> From then on, I'm behind schedule. Well, welcome, and I should say welcome back, because I know we've met before, and this is a wonderful relationship that we have, and I bless you and thank you for all that you do. We started out almost three years ago to change some things and take a different path, and I think it's beginning to pay off uh, the recent drop in unemployment, which has followed others to the point that there are four million people, more people working now than were working a year ago. The fact that real earnings are up 8.9% uh, for this last year. We know about, and you know about, the inflation rate and all those other things. There are some people that are still trying to tell us that we should return to the practices of the past and that reminds me of my sports announcing days. A young rookie walked the first seven men that he'd faced, rookie pitcher, and Casey Stengel pulled him and the kid came storming into the dugout and says, how do you like that? I had a no-hitter going and he pulls me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't think we're that way. I think those people that want us to go the other way are that way. And they're the rookies in, the, in this particular thing. You know, they've said uh, sometimes that if you <clears throat> steal from one person, that's plagiarism. If you steal from 10, that's research. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to remember what the one is if you steal for a, from 100. <laughs> uh, oh, that's, that's scholarship. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, I've never really aspired to be a scholar, but uh, I'll steal from anyone that's got some ideas that'll help us keep on with what we're doing here. Now, I'm not going to go on uh, talking more about the things that we've done. You know the efforts that we've made to return authority and autonomy back to other levels of government, and get them out of the, the federal bureaucracy here. And we, just the other day, we had a management meeting and a report from some of our inspector generals and our management personnel, things that we've done with regard to regulations, with regard to federal publications, and uh, uh, it was pretty wonderful. We have cut the thousands of federal publica publications in half. That's a savings of probably more than a billion pages a year, and I realize there'll be great distress throughout the country. I don't know how the people are going to get along without such publications and booklets as How to Buy Eggs, uh, a few things like that, but we figured that in these hard times we could eliminate those and, and have. But uh, I know we're here for a dialogue instead of a monologue, so um, now that I'm backed up with some fellows I can refer to, if you ask too tough a question, why don't we get to the dialogue? Yes. President Bill Severo from Dallas, Texas. I know, Bill. As the national chairman of this organization, we'd like to express to you our deep appreciation for the close cooperation your administration has maintained with those of us in recognition that there is some folks out there in state government who might know something that would be helpful now and then. May I ask you, Mr. President, uh, those of us who are have been encouraging further new federalism and return of the power to the states. One of those uh, in incentives was to return more of the power of education back to the states. And certainly your excellence in education campaign has been a new breath of life on the scene. When can we look forward to not having a federal department of education and more power? <laughs> well, I'm safe in saying this. When we have a secretary of education himself who wants to eliminate the department, the plain, simple truth is we haven't been able to get our leaders in the Congress on our own side as well as our opponents. 
uh, to get them uh, to eliminate that or the other department, the Department of Energy, both of which we set out to do away with. They created those departments and we just have not been able to get them to move and it requires legislation in order to do that. Both departments, I think, have, uh, wherever they could administratively, brought themselves down to those functions that uh, could be justified as, as being federal. But that is still our goal and uh, so far we just haven't been able to, uh, to make it. I, I'm glad you said that and said the things that you said about us and education because last night I was watching on uh, the C-SPAN channel and they had a representative of the National Education Association and she was talking about uh, some of the problems and so forth and stressing the need, the great need that it was all a, a phony as far as we were concerned because unless we came up with a lot more money and so forth and uh, took more interest in this at the federal level. Well, federal aid to education, as many of you know, has never been more than 8% of the total cost of education. But the trouble was in the past, the government, the federal government has tried to take about 40% of the control and management for its 8% of contribution. And I can't believe that increasing 8% by a fraction uh, is going to make that much difference. Fortunately, on the same channel, they later had some educators that said that money wasn't the problem. Uh, well, one fellow was talking about the ratio of teachers to students, but uh, that ratio happens to have been uh, that we've about cut in half the ratio of students uh, per teacher in this country over recent years, and we still have some of our problems, so there must be other directions to, to look. But I've been very excited uh, since our commission came in with what, just from the report of the commission, what has begun to happen all over the country. Schools that have turned around, school districts, uh, uh, states themselves that have changed the, uh, their curriculum, their requirements for graduation and so forth. It, uh, it's been very inspiring and I think it, it proves just what you've indicated. If you get control back there where it belongs, at the state and the local levels and uh, less outside interference, but then I've always suspected that the National Education uh, Institution over there has, um, in fact, they have voiced at times among themselves their goal. They dream of a federal school system. They don't like it the way it is. They want a national school system. Well, I think little Willie's mother should be able to go see the principal and not have to write to her congressman. <laughs> <laughs> John Rocco in New Jersey had the privilege to second your nomination at the convention. Looking forward to it again. <laughs> I won't answer that yet. <laughs> you have an assessment at this time on the block grant program as you uh, as you view it. You think uh, it's been successful? Uh, yes. Type of assessment? Well, you could probably answer that better than I can. I believe it has the fact that with the block grant program, we get rid of a lot of the. Uh, strings and the red tape attached to it and give you more leeway out at the state and the local level in using those funds, I would like to see it expanded to where that's the way it was. I think that over the years, the federal government not only usurped a lot of the functions, but it usurped then the revenues and left local and state governments kind of strapped as to where they could turn for their revenues, so they had to turn to the federal government for grants. It'd be a lot better if one day we could turn back the sources of revenue and turn back with it the responsibility for these things that properly belong at the state and local level for management. And uh, we're gonna keep on trying to do that. Mr. President, I'm Frank Lester Smith from West Palm Beach, Florida. I bring you uh, greetings, by the way, for the new year from Gladdy Prescott, a uh, long time friend of mine and yours also. From downtown Dixon, Illinois. Right. Um, I represent a large agriculture area, Mr. President, and uh, the Caribbean Basin Initiative has a bejeeper scared out of us, but we're we're holding hands with it and watching it come along. And, uh, but we're also a little bit scared now of the quarantine 37, although it's not as broad an issue as some of these others, it is vital to the agriculture interests of Florida. And I just like like you to think more about that uh, quarantine 37 as far as lifting it and letting all those uh, agriculture parks come in through the United States, particularly Florida. 
why isn't Jack Block here? <laughs> I think you're asking me for one where I don't have some technical answers there, but I know that with the Caribbean Initiative, we intend to, uh, to run that in a way that is not going to be allowed to be detrimental to us. And so, uh, did, Pam, did you? Yes. I'm Representative Martha Klima from the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, Mr. President, we have two more states to come in to call Congress to have a federally balanced budget. I would like to know what your administration's position is uh, for the initiative of the states to do that. We would welcome that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've just been having a meeting earlier in the day on that, on that very subject. We have to have that. Uh, Forty-three states have it. Forty-three states have line item veto, and I'm going to be making a lot of noise in this coming year about the necessity for line item veto. We're not going to get control of the budget until we do. Now, we want to con get control of the, of the deficits, but we don't want to accept some of the recommendations today that under the guise of, of reducing the deficits would undercut and turn around the economic recovery that we presently have. In my view, Deficits are caused because the federal government is taking too big a percentage out of the private sector. And to take more money out of the private sector in order to allow government to stay that same size is not the answer to the deficit. The answer to the deficit is to reduce the federal government's share that it is taking uh, from that private sector. And I, we still think that there's a lot of room uh, in which we can do that. And if those other two states would come along and pass that, uh, there are a lot of us up here on the platform be very happy. Mr. President, my name is Larry Dixon. I'm from the Alabama Senate. I think most of the people in the room realize that one of the reasons your programs have been so successful is because you've been able to take the offense in a Republican-controlled United States Senate. The coming elections will see that balance of power or that control possibly slip away if we're not successful in re-electing some of those Republican senators. Do you as an individual or does the White House have plans to help those senators be re-elected so you can continue to take the offense instead of being put on the defense with a Democratic control? Uh, yes, we do because we couldn't have achieved anything that we've achieved in this line of recovery had we not had control of that one house. That has made all the difference. And if you could figure out a way for us to get control of both houses, uh, you realize that since one of the last 50 years, um, there have been only four years in which uh, a president, or there was a Republican majority in both houses of the Congress, four out of 50. And then there's been an additional three in which we've had this one house, but the other 43 years have been the other party uh, running it. And last night when I heard Mr. Mondale call the deficit my deficit, <laughs> I do not find any place in the Constitution that authorizes the President of the United States to spend a dime. It is all dictated by Congress, and the deficits today would be $40 billion less if we had gotten all the spending cuts we've asked for from Congress. Yes, ma'am. You. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, Judy Petty from the Arkansas House of Representatives and your 76 Arkansas uh, State Campaign Chairman. Uh, the <laughs> what, what I am hearing from the heartland and the sunbelt is when your administration said there is a limit to how much abuse the United States will take from the United Nations, there was a great cry of approval that went out from Main Street if not necessarily from the rest of the country. And I just wanted you to know that we approve of that and would like mm -hmm. to see some more of it and uh, congratulate you on taking some harsh stands. Well, thank you very much. We've, uh, you might be interested to know that early on and long before this latest move that we've made, we talked about doing that when we first came here because we were aware of the shortcomings of that particular program, UNESCO, and then decided that, no, now that we were here, maybe it would be more fitting for us to try and make some changes in that. And now we've had to confess we haven't been able to make the changes, and so uh, we're taking a walk. But uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, God bless her, one, once early on in the campaign, and she and I had had some talks about what to do there, and suddenly uh, on the 
in the General Assembly, uh, they took us on again and some countries hit us over the head. And uh, Jean just wrote 27 letters to the representatives of 27 countries, supposedly friendly to us and somewhat dependent on us, and uh, suggested that what they were doing was not exactly right. And uh, she had 27 visitors over the next few days that dropped in to see her and <laughs> to talk things over. She's done quite a job. Yes. Oh. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Roger Keats from Illinois. I'm, I want to throw out an idea. While, as an example, you were pushing with the new federalism and the balanced budget problem, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell who in Congress who's helping you and who's not. Is there any way in the world, uh, which might be aiming at Lee a little bit, that you could get back to those of us who control the precinct captains who send you this con these congressmen, exactly who's really helping you and who's not? Because if 50 states can balance the budgets, we find it hard to believe this Congress can't. And if we knew who were your real opposition, sometimes we could do a real, well, we could have a friendly talk at home. <laughs> there ought to be a way for you to get that to us, and I just wanted to throw the idea out to you. Thank you. I think it's a good idea. Yes, because it's, I think one of the things is, uh, it's amazing. Most people go about their business, as you know, doing their daily tasks, and they're not they're not like us in Washington reading the Washington Post every day. They, they don't keep track of what government's doing. So it's very easy for some individuals to go home and speak to the local Rotary Club and talk about what they're doing, and they can go back to Washington with no one checking to ma find out that what they said they were doing doesn't match what they're doing when it comes time to raise their hands. So that's a good idea, and yes, we will. I was just told, that's, can I take one take more? One more sir. Yes, All right, that, sir. and then I'm told that's it. <coughs> Mr. President, I'm Bill McAfee from Tennessee, where we will be, tomorrow begin consideration of a lot of your education proposals. Uh, my question, sir, is to you, being associated with the health care industry as I am and private life, some of your thoughts on and your administration in the coming year of helping control or keep down or slow down the cost of health care in our country. Uh, I, I didn't hear all of that. The cost of health care, your plan, sir, oh. any thoughts you might have that uh, I don't think we can stop the rise but maybe slow it down and a little bit in the future. This, there's no question about this problem, and maybe you might be interested in where and how some of this came about. From 1952 to 1978, 1952 in medical care in hospitals in the United States, there was 84 hundredths of one person employee for every patient. Today, there are more than three employees for every patient in the hospital, which has to be one of the contributing factors to this. I have to believe also that government had a, a part in this. Once upon a time, it was standard medical practice that a doctor, he knew he only had one quality of service. He couldn't say, well, this, is a, this patient can't pay as much, so I'll only give him half service. So as we all know, the doctor sat you down when you went in, if it was for an operation or something, and discussed with you your own financial situation. And his fee was fixed according to your ability to pay. And some paid a lot more. But that same doctor also had some people in the books who never, never were charged a dime. And it was a case of this person paying more knew that it was in this way that the doctor could treat those other patients that, that couldn't afford that. When government entered the whole field, as we have, you could understand where a doctor said, well, okay, this is my fee if the government's going to pay it. And so that other system disappeared. And a fee was set. At the same time, without using sharing, without having the individual patient have to pay some percentage of that, there was no limit to overutilization. And obviously there were people that if they were in a hospital, uh, you know, for most of us, when you're in that hospital and you know what the room rent is, the first thing you think about and the first question you ask your doctor is, when can I go home? Well, to these people, it was a lot easier to stay there and be waited on. And frankly, and I don't mean that critical of the doctors. It was also easier for the doctor to have them there instead of having to make house calls. And uh, so he, went, he wasn't going to force them to go home. And I think that all of this has led to medical costs 
being several times higher than the rate of inflation over the last uh, decade or so. It's been going up several times as fast as all other prices. Now, I think some of that government can play a part, and these are discussions that we're having now of uh, things we're going to recommend in the government programs, uh, some of them more co-payment, and obviously recognizing that there are some people so destitute that, no, you, you can't force that on them. But where you can, uh, getting this uh, even as a way to help restrict. I know that some years ago when Britain's totally socialized medicine got out of hand, that uh, Britain put in a very modest charge that the patient had to pay uh, for going to the doctor, and there was a 25 percent reduction in the utilization of socialized medicine just with that little modest uh, co-payment that they had to make. So it, we know it is one of the big problems. As a matter of fact, today, and we're dealing with and trying to talk about Medicare because uh, Medicare is in the same situation that until our bipartisan commission got together on uh, Social Security in the same nearing bankruptcy that Social Security was. And it has to be, something has to be done just for the sake of preserving the program so that it'll be there when people need it. Well, I'm sorry that I can't take the rest of the hands and have to uh, go back across the street, but again, thank you very much for all you're doing and thank you for coming here.